And our second reading comes from the book of Psalm. It's Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this week we start a new sermon series entitled Lessons from Psalms. And we're going to be looking at, for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the book of Psalms and finding how it really impacts us now and today. The psalm we read this morning is one of uh, 150 or so recorded in the book of Psalms. And the psalms are kind of a collection uh, of hymns and poems, maybe even prayers, depending on how you use them. Now, these psalms were written over 100 years ago from various authors. Many of them were written by King David himself uh, about 3,000 or so years ago. Others are attributed to Asaph, um, the sons of Korah, uh, Moses, Solomon, and some are not even really written uh, for sure on the author and are simply labeled anonymous. Now, this sermon is entitled, A Hymn of Praise, and to me, this was kind of a difficult sermon to actually write, which is weird. It shouldn't be. In fact, this morning about six o'clock, I got up and rewrote my sermon. You see, I really had to think about what it means. What does praise mean? And, and to me, praise means to lift up, to exalt, to worship. So the question is, why do we worship God? And I think the problem is, before we even answer that question, we need to answer another question. What is worship? And very simply, although we're going to expand on it, worship is to open our hearts to the love of God. When we worship, we declare God's worth as we find it in Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 to 14, where it says, In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb we praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. You see, we're not called to... It's not a suggestion that we worship. It's not a, a suggestion that we be in praise of God. It's a command. If we look at the scripture we read this morning from the book of Psalm, we see it's a command. Worship is as natural for man as it is for him to breathe. It should be. Worship is to a Christian what an engine is to a car. And quite honestly, it's absolutely crucial. And it's the center, the center part of being uh, in a Christian life. Worship is an act of honoring God because of his great worth to be honored. Now, I've always kind of thought uh, oxymorons are, are kind of funny. They're kind of weird. These are, are self-contradictory terms or phrases. The word itself actually comes from oxius, which means sharp, and moros, which means dull. So it's literally an oxymoron itself. It's contradictory. So here's a, a couple of oxymorons in case you're still kind of confused on maybe what they are. Jumbo shrimp, freezer burn, uh, white chocolate, plastic silverware, 
airline food. And if you've ever been on a plane, you know what I'm talking about there. A sanitary landfill. Truthful tabloids and professional wrestling. All of these are self-contradictory. But here's the one I really want us to look at. Boring worship. It reminds me of this little boy who asked his mother if she could remember the highest number she'd ever counted to. Now, of course, the mother didn't remember. And so she asked her, her little boy, what is the highest number you ever, ever counted to? He answered, 5,372. Now, of course, the mother was a little curious right at this point, and she, she asked him, why did he stop at that number? And he looked at her and said, well, church was over. You see, he was bored. And in various surveys, uh, when people are asked why they don't go to church, they often reply, that church is just too boring. Now, honestly, let's be, you know, in that place where we can understand that, especially for someone who is not a Christian, somebody who maybe didn't grow up in church, worship can be boring. But I want to tell you that true worship is anything but boring. The very essence of what worship is does not allow for it to be boring. When we come before God, the God of the universe, who's created everything and has done amazing things in our lives, we can't help but break out into adoration, to be excited, to worship, to shout hallelujah. But when's the last time we did that? So why do we come together to worship? Why do we do that every week? Why, why can't we do it every couple weeks, maybe once a month? What's really the purpose? Now granted, this is a, a different situation right now. We're, we're not together. We're not in fellowship together. We're worshiping online, and that's definitely not the way we would prefer to do it. We want to be together. But why do we worship? Why do we actually gather together and worship? Well, the first reason is honestly to glorify, to exalt God, to lift him up. True worship is a heartfelt acceptance of God and all of his power and glory in the things we do. To truly worship God, we must know him. In a nutshell, worship is to glorify and exalt God, to show our loyalty and to show our admiration to our Heavenly Father. What's interesting is if you look at some of the churches that are growing, if you really see and examine what those churches look like, not only are they doing lots of, of different ministries outside, but they also offer God exalting worship. Their worship is significant. One expert had this to say. He says, if we haven't learned to be worshipers, it doesn't really matter how well we do anything else. Now, please don't think I'm saying that church should only be about worship. It shouldn't. It can't be. But that's a good place to start. It leads us to other things. The, the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Or simply put, to worship God. We are to praise God, to lift him high. In Revelation 4.11 it says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Again, I look to our psalm that we read this morning, and it commands us to, to exalt him, to lift him up, to praise him. We ought to be excited and thankful for what God is going to do. Like the story of the little boy. He was just a little guy. And it was just him and his dad. And the dad had said, we're going to go on a picnic tomorrow. 
the little boy was so excited. So they got everything ready. They, they had the sandwiches ready and they had the tablecloth and the basket all ready to go. They got everything prepared and then it was time for bed. Well, it was time for bed, but that little boy was so excited. And if you've ever seen a little kid excited, they almost shake with excitement physically shaking, so excited. So they go to bed and very shortly, the dad is, well, shaken awake. The little boy is standing there and as any parent does, uh, your first thought is, what's wrong? And the little boy says, there, there's, there's nothing wrong, I just can't sleep. And of course the father says, well, why can't you sleep? And he says, well, I'm too excited about tomorrow. I just can't sleep. The father, understanding the little boy's excitement, says, I understand, I'm excited too. It's gonna be a great day. But to really have a great day, we need to get a good night's sleep. We need to get some rest. So go back to bed, and when you wake up, it'll be time. So the little boy, still shaking with excitement, goes back to bed. And it's sleep time again, at least for the father. Shortly, he's shaken awake again. It's the little boy. Now dad's a little, little upset at this point. He said, what's wrong now? And the little boy says, I just want to thank you for tomorrow. You see, when we, when we exalt God, when we come to him as a child would and worship for everything he has ever done, big or small, we're truly honoring him. We need to come to worship God because worship is a source of power. In the New Testament church, when the church was just really starting out, worship was a mighty source of power. For the life and the growth of those individual Christians as well as the newborn church. When they met together, they, they were strengthened and encouraged. Their lives were refined. They had a, a clear sense of identity and purpose, and they became better equipped to serve God. And that's true today, too. When we meet to worship together, we find strength in worship. We know our purpose, and hopefully we're becoming better equipped to serve God. I don't know about you, but when I don't have church, my week feels kind of dull. In fact, I will tell you that this upcoming week is not going to be a great one for me because I didn't get together with all of you for worship. Yes, we're doing worship here, but it's not the same. It isn't the same thing as fellowship. I mean, honestly, all the elements are here except for the gathering together. Worship was a main factor in helping to make the church, the power filled, the growing movement that it was. Worship must be a factor that must be present if the church is to live and grow as it should. And if Christians are to find the quality of life which, which Jesus wants for us, then we need to spend time in worship, not only individually, but together as a church. Worship is when we walk away from a service not saying, oh, that was nice music, that was a, a nice special, or even that was a great sermon. You can say that, but that's not the main purpose. We need to instead be walking away saying, what a great God. Unfortunately, churches are worshiping in a way that gets people to respond a little like the little girl when she was saying her bedtime prayers and said, dear God, we had a great time at church today, but I wish you had been there. For us to find that source of power through worship, when we come in to worship together, we must bring with us several things. We must have an open heart. 
It's taking off that mask, letting God see what is really in our hearts, because he can anyways. When we come with an open heart, we're, we're not pretending, we're not being hypocrites, we're not putting on a show, we're simply coming to worship, to praise and thank him. We also must have a focus on the Holy Spirit. It's taking a focus off of our personal agendas and saying, what can I give to God? Not going to service saying, what is in it for me? It's a, a willingness to submit to God's desires and not our own. To submit our lives to living by God's Spirit, that it be Him alone that should be seen. We need to come to church with a real hunger and a real thirst. A real hunger and a real thirst. Jesus said in Matthew, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they will be filled. And he told the Samaritan woman, Whoever drinks the water he gives will be filled. When we approach worship, we should come wanting God's presence, seeking God's presence, and hungering for God's presence. And lastly, we need to come with a true hope. I think we should come to worship with a hope for a future that God is going to give us. But we also need to come with the hope that God has answers. That you'll find strength, that we will find strength in him. Because if we come to worship with an open heart, a Holy Spirit focus, and a hunger, I can assure you that you will leave with a true hope. When we come to worship, we can bring those four things, that there will always be a powerful moving of God's Spirit and His presence that will equip and enable the church to move mountains, even in Royal Center. And the church that worships in spirit and truth has a powerful attraction. People notice, they, they recognize something's happening there and they want to be a part of it. Not because of us, but because of God. It, it strips away the things that block the heart and the eyes. It strips away personal agendas. It strips away false pretenses and the masks that we wear and it holds Jesus up. It becomes real and genuine. People see it, they know it, they feel it with all they are, with their heart and their mind and their soul, and they walk away with a God-sized hope, a soul hunger that is both filled and craving and a heart that knows that God cares. True biblical worship, the praise of God, satisfies our total personality, that we don't have to shop around for man-made substances. It's really kind of heartbreaking. The thousands of Christians seem to experience little, if any, growth through their worship experience. And some of the, that some of the churches generate very little power through worship. We should come out of church with a bounce in our step. Calvin Coolidge said, It is only when men begin to worship that they begin to grow. We worship him on Sundays, or whenever your Sabbath is, because we are created to worship him. Our choice is not whether we'll worship, but who we will worship. God will not share worship with anything or anyone else. He will not. When Satan tempted Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I think this illustrates a, a, an important principle. Whatever we worship, we'll end up serving. Worship is the ultimate decision. Just knowing that God can be worshipped provides an incredible opportunity for each one of us. 
but also knowing that God takes note of our worship. It's sometimes difficult to understand. A story goes that there was a gentleman who was in a car wreck. As the paramedics rush to him, he was, he was almost sobbing. My Mercedes, my Mercedes. The paramedics got to him and asked him, sir, are you okay? The man sobbed, my car, how's my car? As the paramedics began to look over him, they say, sir, your car is totaled. However, that should not be your biggest concern. In fact, sir, your arm is laying in the middle of the road over there. Oh no, the man said, my Rolex, my Rolex. We have to be careful what we worship, don't we? Anyone who has ever used a spell check on their computer in the, in the Word document programs has seen some pretty funny recommendations for uh, spellings and, and words, uh, sometimes words we didn't even know existed. And in fact, sometimes the dictionary that is on the spell checker doesn't have all the words either. There was a minister who was, was writing a column focusing on the need to lift up Jesus in the marketplace. And when he'd finished typing out the words, the article, um, he ran a spell check. And the program, interestingly enough, came across the word Jesus. And it said, does not exist. This actually prompted a later column by the same pastor in which he told his readers, Jesus does not exist in anybody's vocabulary, including a spell checkers, until you intentionally insert it. You see, we are created to worship God, but when we come to church, we have to be intentional in our worship to him. We are called to worship. We very much are. To worship is to get away from focusing on ourselves and to instead focus on God. Worship is concentrating on how good he is, not just about what he's done for us. As we continue through this sermon series of, of examining the Psalms, we need to recognize that, especially through this particular message, we don't worship God like we should. We really don't. We kind of lose focus, I think, sometimes. Don't get me wrong, we enjoy the singing. Like I said, worship, for me, uh, has to have music. We have to have music for it to be worship in my mind. We may enjoy the sermon. We may enjoy the children's message. I even remember one young man who said, I enjoy offering. We may enjoy all those bits and pieces, all the fellowship, all of those different things, but it's not about us. It's not about pleasing us or making us happy. Worship should not be about thinking about ourselves. Worship is placing God first in our lives, in the good and the bad times. Worship is making him number one in our finances in our pleasure and leisure times, in our intimate times, in our jobs, in our families, in our quiet times, in our running around times. He is totally worth 100%. Anything less is more or less an insult to God. Not, not more or less, it is an insult to God. Anything less than 100%. God is filled with, with love and compassion, grace, and mercy, not treating us as our sins deserve. When we worship, are we exalting and honoring God? When we are worshiping, do we find the source of power? And when we worship, do we realize that we are created to worship him? Are we truly praising God the way he deserves to be praised? If not, what do we need to change? <clears throat> what work do we need to do to correct that? Let's remember that God deserves our praise completely and totally. Let's bow our heads.